All right, so in today's episode, we're talking with Gary, who is a former marketing executive at companies like eBay and also Chegg. He since then shifted his focus to Airbnb and has been absolutely crushing it. So we're gonna talk about his strategy behind each property, what his non-negotiables are. We're also gonna deep dive into his pricing secrets and how he's able to capture the highest amount of revenue as possible. He's making over $30,000 a month in cash flow from his portfolio. You're not gonna wanna miss this one. All right, we're live. So we got Gary um, here in the house. He's been absolutely crushing it. Uh, some of the listings, uh, you know, just looking on his for his Airbnbs are just awesome and just kind of textbook of how you should be setting them up. So excited to be having this conversation with you, Gary. Hey, Preston. How are you? Doing good, man. So let's just get, kind of get right into it. So if you want to tell us about your background, uh, you know, maybe what you do for work and uh, we'll, we'll take it from there. All right. Sounds good. So my journey, right? So I started in tech. So uh, my background has been in marketing and operations. I was working for eBay um, for five years and then Chegg. Many of you probably heard of Chegg, education startup. So I was running the marketing team there as late as all the way into 2017. After that, I did a lot of um, marketing consulting. Um, as I mentioned before, most of my work has been in marketing, advertising, operations, and stuff like that. And I really got into real estate investment probably when I first um, sort of first got my house back in 2006. So I did a lot of construction, did a lot of renovations. And luckily enough, my best friend since uh, elementary school or middle school has been in, in kind of in construction since 2005. So me and him have been doing projects you know, since all the way back to like 2006 or so forth, right? You know, when doing that, I got really interested in doing construction, but what got me really interested in, in, in their Airbnb business is, you know, I started traveling around the time that I was at eBay and Chegg, did a lot of traveling and actually started booking places on Airbnb. Probably my first booking was, I would say 2013, 2012 or so. So so over 10 years ago, that's when I started, started actually staying at other people's houses, right? And just looking at, kind of like looking at people's characteristics, like their own homes, right? Because I think Airbnb started when people were actually, actually renting their own home own house out right so more like you know they would rent a house out and then they would leave for a few days and you can stay at their house right you know one house i actually stayed in, in helsinki you know the guy was 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 uh, finnish and he had a lot of the same taste that i had right like the same speakers the same decorations and you know he, it was such a like a like a close-in environment he was we were friends we were pen pals we we're still pen pals and friends to this day but we actually never met each other i only stayed at his house stayed in his bed and so forth right and it got really interested in, in, in Airbnb. So kind of morphing that construction background and then that sort of Airbnb desire and also the desire to kind of do construction and, and actually make things look really nice. Then it really got me into Airbnb. Probably my first sort of Airbnb listing was about 2020, right? So I started dabbing into Airbnb for about three years now. And, um, you know, using my marketing skills, using my construction skills, and also using sort of that that you know, the desire to, to, to make something look nice and also, you know, sort of me traveling to totally different places kind of made me into kind of like my personality made it really, really interesting to be in sort of full time doing Airbnb and doing, um, you know, property management and property investment. So that's where I'm at currently. Gotcha. No, thanks for the background. So clearly you kind of seen from all market cycles dating back to 2006 and, you know, into that, you know, financial crash of 08, you know, kind of leading up to now. So you've kind of seen you know, Airbnb from its infancy, literally to, you know, where it's at today. Um, I know, you know, your shirt says Home Collective. So is that your property management company or what does that a company do? Yeah, this is my home. Uh, this is my property management company. So most of our properties right now is in Austin. So not only do I, you know, own my own properties, but I also do some management for some of our investors. Most of our investors are from the Bay Area. All my properties right now that that's in Austin is is all on Airbnb. So, you know, we do our own management, we do the, the construction, the, the, the renovations, the design, all the way down to, you know, sort of setting up the place, right? So putting in the furniture and stuff like that. Awesome, man. Yeah, and, uh, your listings are awesome. We're gonna get, get into those here in a little bit. Let's talk about your very first property. So let's talk about, you know, how'd you find it? You know, why Austin as well? You know, what are some of the reasons that drew you to that market? So let's, let's start there uh, with your first property. Yeah, so it's funny, right? So my, my partners at the current construction business here in the Bay Area, they, you know, we, we together saw an opportunity in Austin. This was back in 2020, you know, sort of right, right after COVID hit, right? Where, you know, sort of people, there was a lot of uncertainty in the construction business, a lot of uncertainty in the real estate business. And what we started seeing was there's a lot of houses in Austin and a lot of people started traveling, not traveling outside of the U.S., but traveling inside the U.S. You know, Austin is a is a is an interesting place, right? Because it's right in the heart of 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 uh, the U.S. You know, when they first started before Silicon Valley, a lot of people saw Austin as not only as the sort of the mid sort of Silicon Valley, but a lot of companies actually were moving there even before coming into San Jose or the Bay Area. And me being from the Bay Area, I really saw well, Austin is very similar, right? You know, you have. A lot of people moving into Austin from many different places, a lot of tech companies. You know, eBay is also there, right? Like, you know, I have one property that's walking distance to eBay in Austin, which is funny enough. Uh, Apple Campus is really close to a couple of my properties. 
So there was a lot of sort of uh, the tech side that's awesome, that's very attractive. And to be frank with you, you know, one of my number one rules about you know, Airbnb uh, property management is, is or investing is really trying to go into a place where I enjoy living at. And Austin is one of those places I could totally see myself moving to. Like I mentioned before, the tech background, but also just just the just the entertainment value of Austin, right? So they have a really you know pretty downtown. There's uh, the domain area, which is very up and coming, and then they also have obviously the lake and the outdoors, right? So it's a place where I love to travel to, and it's a place that I saw a huge opportunity because of all the tech investment that's been in that property or in that area. Yeah, I think that's an overlooked um, aspect of it, right? Because a lot of people were, you know, chasing the returns, obviously wanting to make this a side business or you know, full blown business. But you know, that the other aspect too, like because we have properties where we like to travel to, and we've done that. We've done a family vacation at one of our properties in Arizona. It's cool where we can just kind of create memories, you know, for you know, our family. Of course, the cash flow is good as well, but I think that's an overlooked aspect of investing into Airbnbs. And funny enough, uh, me and my wife were talking about, because we've never been to Texas, but we want to go. And obviously Austin's high on our list. So I'm definitely going to be staying at one of your properties when we're down there. No, Austin is a lovely place, right? And I think to, to add on to that, right? So back in 2020, so my partners and I were like, okay, that's, you know, Austin looks very interesting, right? Because we saw a lot of people moving in there pre-COVID and even during COVID and the housing, um, the numbers made sense, right? So when you look at sort of the property value, sort of the return on the investment from just air, air DNA data, looking at Austin, it, it made sense in that, in that case. And also, also adding on the fact that I enjoyed going there, right? So another interesting story is, you know, during my travels, when I was sort of, when I left Chegg, my full-time job and doing consulting, and in between that doing, you know, working with my friend on his construction company, you know, my wife is actually from Europe. So, you know, she moved here right up after COVID and going to Austin was sort of one of her first sort of, uh, uh, sort of, sort of vacation here in the Bay, in, in, in the U.S. because we couldn't get out of the country, right? So uh, we went to Hawaii, we went to Austin and she just loved Austin, right? You know, I have a, I have a two and a half year old baby. So when she were first went there, um, you know, she, she wasn't she wasn't born yet, but when, she, when we were able to go there, you know, after she was born, even my baby daughter really loves kind of like the whole environment of Austin, just running around a huge back, the swimming pool and such. But, you know, that's kind of like how I started getting the, getting into the property management because I really wanted to, to go to go travel there. And I also see myself kind of taking a break when I go to Austin to see the properties. Like, oh, it's a vacation, mini vacation for myself. Kind of away, get away from the family, get away from the stress here in the Bay Area. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting that you say that because I know a lot of people you know, Joe Rogan is, you know, a huge advocate of Austin moving from California. So, you know, it's kind of you know, off topic a little bit, but what, what's like, how is the Bay area currently from, cause obviously you, you hear a lot, of, a lot of these headlines about that area in particular, and then, you know, everyone's kind of migrating, shifting over to Austin and stuff. So what's kind of from your perspective, you know, what's changed in the Bay area and what, why do you feel like so many people are moving to, you know, say in Austin? Yeah, so, you know, to be very with you, I actually had that conversation with my wife about myself moving to Austin, right? Because when you look at the Bay Area, um, you know, everything is so expensive now in the Bay Area, and everything has been more expensive after COVID, obviously. But when you look at just even gas prices, right, I think it's probably probably about 40%, even 40% higher, or maybe even like 50 or 60%, depending on what kind of gas you're getting, compared to a place like Austin. You know, we're looking at, you know, 5 $6 a gallon now in, in the Bay Area. Um, the houses here, you know, like when I was looking at a comparison, you know, my, the houses that I, you know, the house that I have in the Bay Area would be probably about one fifth of the cost of the same house in Austin, right? And we're also, you know, my house right now is probably about two miles away from Apple, just like the house that I have in Austin. And you're looking at, you know, at least seriously, like about five to six X difference in terms of the prices. You know, I, I always joke with my friends, like I'm living in this really weird situation where you know, I'm living in a really expensive place, but I'm making money in, in Austin where I'm paying, you know, high property taxes in Austin, but I'm also not getting the benefit of the no state tax in Texas because I'm paying state taxes here in California. So I think that's where people, a lot of people see, right? And, and with the change in, you know, thinking about people migrating to, you know, right now we're doing our interviews, you know, on, on air and, you know, obviously, you know, we're, we're hundreds or even thousand miles apart. A lot of people are starting to work remotely as well, right? So. Uh, that kind of eliminates the need to stay in Bay Area where it's really expensive. And if they move to a place like Austin, it really makes sense, right? Because if they're dialing in the East Coast or West Coast, they're kind of right in the middle. It's it's interesting and it's something that I always thought about, but I never really actually moved because I, you know, my family's here, a lot of friends here. And I kind of like the fact that I can just travel to Austin probably once or twice a month right now. So that's what I'm currently doing. Nice. Love it. And you, you're clearly a, can be a spokesperson person for, for Austin and I'm sure they they love that too. So. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to share my yeah. screen here real quick, uh, pull up, pulling up one of your listings so that we can kind of get through some of your 
thought process behind this. So, so this is one of your newest listings, which is, you know, clearly just from the first few photos, you've done an amazing job. So let's kind of go through the pictures, kind of get a thought process. Cause you know, I always preach all the time, right? Your photos are going to be your main seller and the way that you organize because a lot of people don't really understand like what goes into making an airbnb listing great in this particular case you know you you've highlighted and i i totally agree i think like you've done pick the perfect picture to kind of really bring that person in that's scrolling through airbnb and then you know kind of figure out more about your property so let's kind of talk about your thought process behind uh, you know each of these photos yeah so a couple of rules that i have right so i i think number one rule that i talked about is really sort of enjoying kind of a, having really a, an Airbnb or a place. If you're really going to market this Airbnb, you really want it to be some place that we want to stay at. So either the city or even like in Austin, right? Like if even if you pick a city that you like, you really want to have that property be something that you really, you yourself would want to vacation in because you really want to put yourself in someone else's shoes, right? And then the second piece is really understanding your city, right? So, you know, just an example. So Austin gets really hot. So I think right now it's probably about 100 degrees there right now in the beginning of June and in July and August it might even get to 110, right? So having a pool is like a main necessity in a city like Austin. And in comparison, if you're comparing the Bay Area, having a pool might not be something that really someone looks for. Out of all the properties that I have in Austin, every single property that I'm getting now, I'm really trying to target something with a pool because that to myself is, is understanding my city, right? Because in that city, people go to that city, they're looking for outdoor space, they're looking for a pool, they're looking for a place where they can relax in 110 degree heat. So that's the first piece, right? And also really understanding kind of like what the key dates, what the key sort of uh, things that people go there for. So the second picture, I don't know if you, if you can actually look at that, but the second picture I actually created like like a, on the, that picture. So I don't know if you can really see it, but I actually had that custom made. So there's a sign that says, bad decisions makes the best memory. And on the bottom it says Austin, Texas, right? So I really want people to take a picture um, under that so you can promote not only my property but also promote kind of the city in itself right so this third one is really like i've kind of already dived into it it's kind of like the the amenities right so people look for pools people look for pool tables right you know i decided to put a lot of arcades in there because you know then it can attract not only males but also or females but also males as well you know i i also also try if you keep flick flickering there's a lot of things that i also put into this right so the bed selection right so I really wanted to to get as many beds in this house as possible because knowing that there's a pool, there could be some kids in there, there could be adults. So a couple of the rooms I I made it, I made sure that there's bunk beds for the kids. There is you know full size beds, there's queen size beds, there's king size beds. So there's an array of different uh, places where people can stay no matter who they are. If it's if they're the adult, they're the teenager, or even you know like a five year old, they all have a comfortable place to stay at because now I'm trying to maximize for sort of the family stay as well. And then the fourth thing that I really want to look at is also the, the guest selection. So mm -hmm. when you look at the property itself, it is funny, right? Because when you think about the pronouns, right? So people are starting to do this now. So, you know, on your LinkedIn profile, there's the, the she, the her, the he, the him, the they, or the them, right? But on a property, I also try to, to do that as well. So in this property, I'm trying to go after more of the females because from my understanding right, and also from my experience males and females tend to like different things in their properties and they also have different behaviors right so this house is a little bit closer to the neighbors than, than I would really like so that's why I made the fence a little higher when I redesigned the house so these are actually eight foot fence so that way the neighbors can't even see me even from the second floor but also I really wanted this house to be more female because I noticed that just from my previous experience females tend to be less rowdy, right? They, let, they tend to be less, you know, play, doesn't play music as loud. It's not gonna bother my neighbors as much. And, and that works for this closer space. So that's why for this particular listing, I decided to put a lot more Instagrammable items, such as that, you know, Austin neon light that you saw, or even that one on the bottom right hand corner here, that ooh la la sign. That's also to kind of attract more of the female uh, sense, right? And even when you click on that picture, there's actually a photo booth in this, uh, in this uh, property as well that does Polaroid pictures. It's in one of the pictures, yeah, right there on the, if you go to the next photo, there's a Polaroid camera right there and there's a mirror that they can actually take a picture, like kind of look at their, those themselves before they take these Polaroid pictures. So I really wanted to target the female side. And that's kind of like, if you see a lot of the stuff that I put on there, it, it's, it's, it's starting to get more sort of targeting the female crowd, right? And then the males also, you know, some of the other things are more male uh, dominant, right? So I put more like sports games in there. And for the males on the other side, right, even though they're going to be louder, but to be frank with you, they actually complain a lot less about these properties. And Preston, you might be able to say this as well, right? So, you know, not to generalize or anything like that, but a lot of times, you know, the, the guys would be louder. They might break things, but they're never going to really complain about something that's broken. Whereas the, the females, if they see something, you know, as, as simple as, oh, the light doesn't turn on or, you know, they're missing a hairdryer, 
you know, you'll get a message and, and, and you would have to kind of deal with that, right? Where the guys are probably don't even care at all, right? So, so but this burger house is more male centric. So you see this, you know, the grill, the big sort of Texas style barbecue grill, you know, there's a pool table, there's a ping pong table and the ping pong table, you know, so many people actually play beer pong there. Like, you know, I have a camera that, that's on the exterior of the house. So I see people that come in and out. And everybody, most of the guys take advantage of that ping pong table as a, as a beer pong table. So that's, this house is definitely more targeted towards the, the males of, of, of the, uh, the genre right here. So this one is a second property that you're looking at. This one is also in Austin, North Austin. So this one has been around since July. Yeah, and quite interestingly enough, I think the, you know, I'm, I think this actually is a really good segue into sort of my next thing that I do with my properties, right? So if you look at the check availability here on this listing, this listing yeah. has been kind of fully out on every single weekend for the whole summer, all the way up until about October. And that's been actually booked out since maybe I would say about February. So, so starting in February, it's been already booked out pretty much every single weekend all the way up into October. And, and you know, I talked to a lot of people about this, right? A lot of my friends who also manage Airbnb, a lot of my friends who, who are investors, right? And, and a lot of them were like, well, Gary, maybe you're just underpricing it, right? But I guess one of the things that, you know, the fourth or the fifth key that I also look at is kind of like the pricing in the area. So for this particular house, you know, because it has a pool, because it has all these amenities, I'm really also targeting people that are trying to book in advance. So I actually have a theory with the pricing, right? So I always, obviously use price labs. You know, a lot of times, you know, before when I first started in 2020, when I didn't see a, a listing get sort of booked maybe a week or two in advance, I get kind of nervous and I start lowering the prices. But what I understand at that point is, when I start lowering the prices, what I actually see is that the quality of the guest starts deteriorating a little bit. Let's let's take a step back, right? So so my philosophy has been more I lower the price in the beginning to try to ramp up book rates so everything gets booked out, all the weekends get booked out. And if they canceled or if so if, if so I have some extra dates left over, then I actually try to increase the pricing at that point. Because what actually happens when someone's looking at my listing is that, you know, Airbnb might give me the the rare find kind of symbol on the listing when people are looking for it. But on top of that, now take a step back, right? I'm, I'm actually booking people that are booking in advance. So I'm guessing those are higher quality because they are booking things in five months, four months, maybe six months in advance. You know, they're probably going to be more of the type that you can trust your house with, right? Because they're not the procrastinator type that they're really thinking about booking everything. And funny enough, like the people that actually book that much in advance, even if they're doing bachelor or bachelorette parties, in the same note, they're also booking their events. So they're not even staying at your house that often. They're probably out of the house most of the time, but they're very organized and they book things super in advance. And I'm also perhaps getting a lower price, but what happens is then I'm pretty much set up and I know that they're gonna take care of my house a little bit nicer than, than someone that's gonna book last minute. And I don't have to scramble and try to try to fulfill, you know, my empty dates as well. So so that's kinda of like the fifth thing, right? So it's a pricing. Like really understand the pricing. So I talked about figuring out, you know, the, the dates and price labs will do that for you, right? So if there's an important date in your area, they'll definitely raise the prices for you. But for me, I really try to stay away from the smart pricing because I always notice that the Airbnb smart pricing just tries to get your place booked out and they'll lower the price as much as they can to get it booked out. And for me, I'd rather have it lowered in the beginning so people book it. And then now my listing just shows like it's really rare and people really want to book it now. Yeah, I was, um, so first of all, like rewind the last eight, <laughs> eight to 10 minutes because Gary just put on a masterclass of like a pro Airbnb, obviously you can tell from his listings and you know giving his insights his thought process so go rewind the past 10 minutes because that's a lot of good information in there but you know going back to your airbnb smart pricing an airbnb i was assigned to airbnb ambassador and they straight up told me like yeah our pricing tool is trash so don't use it and so if you they, what, what like basically what airbnb cares about is they just want people to get booked at a really good price so that there's people that continue to use the they continue to use the the platform but what they don't care about is, you know, hosts and how much they're making, right? So that's why, you know, you use it, you know, I use it. I, you know, te tell every one of our members to use Price Labs just because from, from my experience, it is the best and more, most comprehensive tool. The way, you know, pricing works, basically, you know, if you come here and try to click on a few, I mean, you're so booked out that <laughs> got to find some availability. But basically, you know, what happens is if you start clicking through different dates, it's going to change the pricing based on see like it changed you know hundred dollars less it's going to change depending on you know the like the demand uh for that time period so you know price using some sort of pricing tool is going to be key if you want to you know maximize your revenue yeah I, I, president if you don't mind go back to the other listing because yep. the other listing is much more fresh right so to the other listing i actually posted it up less than 10 days ago so that one with the uh with the yep. staircase and that one i, I believe 
like every day I'm getting about one or two bookings and I'm starting to get the summer books out booked out too. So I think June is pretty yep. booked out. July is starting to get full out. And right now the funny thing is the only thing that's really driving this is, is my super host status. It doesn't even have the reviews yet because I only had one person stay so far. So I only got one review for this property. So the stars isn't really even affected or even, even on the listing. And people are booking it seriously to your point, just looking at the pictures, right? And probably because I'm a super host. I think the prices for this one, I could probably go a little bit higher. And I actually think last night before I went to sleep, I actually raised the... So so price price labs does like a base price, right? So the base price for this one, I believe before was like 448. And I actually raised it to 5, 548. So I raised it by a hundred bucks. So now let's see if I get some more bookings, right? But I'm starting to get most of the the summer days booked out as well. And that's been on this topic, right? So under understanding the pricing. So, you know, I one one other thing that, that I really, really stress, right? And I don't know if you agree with me, Preston, is that I hate the monthly rentals. I, I really do. I, I hate that. I don't like the weekly rentals as well. And another thing about Airbnb pricing is they always try to force you to do these sort of monthly discounts and weekly discounts. And I just I hate it. And I'll explain it in a second, right? So they would probably say like, oh, monthly discount should be like 35% off. And then, you know, weekly discount, they'll give you like a recommendation of maybe like 21% or something like that. And for me, I'm like, no, I don't want to give any of that because um, one of the biggest reasons is that when I find, I mean, I did this by experience, right? So when people stay in my house for a month, not only am I giving them a discount, but a lot of times if there's something wrong with the house, I don't have time to fix it. And they would really get upset over certain things, right? So let's say, for instance, the light switch isn't working and if someone is staying there for three days, they might just tell you on the way out, like, oh, by the way, this light switch isn't working. But if they're staying there for 30 days, they'll be like, oh my God, your light switch isn't working. And then they would demand you to fix it. And in the end, they might claim to Airbnb that, hey, look, this light switch is broken and a bunch of other stuff is broken and they might even not want to pay you at all and try to get a reimbursement for the stay. For me, you know, for a lot of people that are starting, starting with, with these bookings, I would strongly advise to kind of lower that rate me, for me, I think the weekly discount rate is, is less than 10% and the monthly one is probably about somewhere in the teens. Because honestly, I'd rather just book it on every single weekend and just have someone stay there for four days and then get the same amount of someone staying there for seven days, right? If they're booking it for the whole week. And for me, then I could, you know, if something goes wrong, at least I know that they're like, oh, they're only passing by and they wouldn't make a big deal out of it, right? And Preston, I don't know if you agree with me. I mean, how, what's your philosophy on the weekly and the monthly? Yeah, I think it comes down to, you know, what target audience you're trying to cater towards. So obviously, you know, the way that you set up your listing, you're going to be able to charge a premium to, you know, bachelor parties, bachelorette parties, and so on. And so clearly, like just from your pricing and also the way you set up your listing itself, you're going to attract a different person or a different sort of clientele versus, you know, let's say if you just kind of made it a little bit more plain Jane where it was just, you know, none of the huge like amenities like a pool, you know, like neon signs, game rooms. That's probably going to attract more of um, you know someone that's interested in like a long term stay. But I do agree. Like the, a lot of people sit, think that midterm rentals or weekly rentals are great because now your calendar is getting booked up. But a lot of the times, those are going to be the pickiest uh, people because, like you mentioned, they're going to ask for, hey, like there's like a dust bunny in the corner. Like I want the cleaning fee reimbursed. I noticed there's there's a lot more things because they're actually going to be living in there for the next week or two weeks or three weeks. And yes. I remember. We had a guest stay for, I think it was like six weeks once. And I mean, obviously, like, for the most part, they were great guests and we got a lot of you know revenue from that stay. But they literally <laughs> wrote down like two page document worth of you know items yeah. that we needed to change. And like, and obviously, like I'm going to take criticism well, just because I want to have the best experience for our guests. But 90 to 95 percent of the items on that document was just complete BS and just like. I just, I just, I don't yeah. know how a sane person could like say those things. But anyway, so I, I do agree with you. But of course, it's going to come down to your market, your property, and all these other factors. And of course, midterm rentals, you know, longer term stays can be lucrative. But yeah, I, I, I do. I'm, I think I'm on the same page with you. Yeah, and the cleaners hate it too because when they come into the house, usually they exhausted pretty much all their supplies. And on top of that, they probably leave a bigger mess because they've been there for 30 days, right? Whereas someone would be there for three days, and then that cleaning is a lot easier, and it's going to be. You actually really want your place to be cleaned multiple times in a month or just once a month. You're going to see a lot of issues, right? Yeah, and I think uh, going, getting back to this, right? So the another thing about the um, the property is also understanding the city, but also the, the, the amenities too, right? So um, for this for this listing, since you're looking at this, right, it has a swimming pool. I think this actual house actually or also has a sauna in it too, right? And then also the jacuzzi and all that stuff. And I think we were looking at, I think Preston, now you, you and I were, were, were talking to one of the... Um, 
one of the one of our members, right? And then her name was Lila, and she had a house, I believe, near the ocean. And then we, you know, I suggested putting like sort of this kayak there, right? Mm -hmm. And I think based on every single house, understanding your city, you will be able to put some of these amenities that fit your city. And you really need to do that because at the end of the day, right? Like I have some listings on here that that don't get as high as bookings because, you know. These houses get a lot of bookings because not only do they stay a lot of people, but they also have really rare amenities such as the sauna, such as the jacuzzi, yep. the pool, they more to fit 15 people. So when you look at a, like even a big city like Austin, there might only be a handful of places that, that, that have all these amenities. But if I take away a pool, if I take away the jacuzzi, if I take away the 15 people to only 10 people, now you know, the filter becomes very, very, you, you basically are in a competition with a lot more properties. Right. So the property that we talked about with the with the boat, you know, if they can add that a boat, I think the boat is one of the options, right? So so that if someone were actually was looking for a boat in that city, then your house becomes that filter that actually is one of the houses that has it. So that's another thing you really want to think about is not to make a plain Jane house where you're in competition with thousands of other houses, because there's no way you're gonna get your house booked out that way. So for me I really look for a pool, look for these amenities, not only because it fits my city, but it also separates me from my competition. Uh, and every city is different, right? So, you know, like I mentioned before, I live in, I live in uh, the Bay Area, Silicon Valley. A pool here isn't very important. And something that's really important here would be like a dedicated space, right? Like if you had like your own private office with a bunch of computers, bunch of stuff in there because people are coming in here for work. So, so if you have that, that could be something that's attractive, like, you know, attractive to someone else, right? Um, I think a place like Kessimi or Orlando, right? So I have some friends who own properties there. You know, a pool becomes a very, very important attribute there because obviously once again, it's so hot, but people that go there are for kids or vacationing there and they want to have that pool. So, you know, a pool in, you know, I, I was talking to a couple of my buddies who own property in Minnesota. You know, a pool wouldn't make sense in Minnesota, right? So these are attributes that are, are, are different amenities that might not fit in different cities. So that's why you really have to understand your city to understand what the amenities will really drive up your bookings. Yes, yeah, 100%. Um, they, and, and, you know, obviously, like, the biggest theme there was just to do your market research, understand your market, and then cater towards, um, you know, the, the right clientele as well. You know, a lot of great insights. Clearly, you know, you were very successful at your marketing career as well because uh, you're thinking about it in all the right ways. Um, so kind of shifting gears a little bit. So I know, you know, people are going to be interested. Obviously, you know, you have some killer listings. So what's your current, you know, monthly cash flow from all, all of your properties uh, currently um so right now it, i have seven properties that's currently live and currently this one i think is going to be there's going to be one more coming and it's about eight so each one of them i'm targeting so so, so, so some of the big ones with a pool i'm trying to get a gross my target is usually about 10k a month on the gross so we back into kind of like what that's going to net so I'll probably a successful one is going to get you about five to six k positive in, uh, cash flow per month now, for me, I'm a little bit different. I think a lot of uh, students are doing more of the Airbnb arbitrage. But for me, because one of the reasons why I'm not doing Airbnb arbitrage is because you see from the properties, I'm putting a lot of investment into it. And I really don't want to do the arbitrage and have the owner come in after two years or three years and take the house back, right? Because then I'll just basically be spending a lot of my design work and a lot of, you know, like, like as you see in this picture, the staircase and, and even that, that drop ceiling on top of the pool table, those are all amenities that I put into the house. So... For me, I tend to buy the house and or get investors to buy with me, opposed to um, to doing the Airbnb arbitrage. And there's nothing wrong with doing Airbnb arbitrage. It's just that if you do it that way, then you really have to be careful how much money you're putting into it because at the end of the day, you might need to give that property back, right? And you can't, I can't take away that staircase, right? I can't take that with me to the next place, you know. Um, so those are things I'm thinking about. So in in short, the answer would be every property, you know, the target range is about 5k for me per month, so it's about 50 percent of the actual gross is what I take home. It's kind of like what I'm looking at. And right now I'm trying to build awesome to be about 10 of those and, and then, you know, each city to have about 10. So my rule is once I get into Austin, I want to automate, I'm starting to automate it. Right. So I have, you know, I use a hospitable as, as my messaging tool, right. I use price labs. Um, I use uh, Turno as the cleaning service. So I'm starting to automate a lot of different systems. And with that, you know, for one city, I can probably get to 20 to 30 properties pretty easily. And then once I exhausted that, then I probably want to jump into the next city. So I'm, I, 
you know, the next city I might jump into is, is something like in San Diego, right? If I can still get into it with their STR rules changing, that's probably the next place I want to get into. Or some place like Kesame, right? Because my daughter's getting older and she's going to want to go to Disney. Is Disney, I always get confused. Disney World? Disney World, right? And the one in Florida. So she's probably going to want to go yeah, to Disney West. World and Disneyland in California. Yeah, yeah. So and then also Anaheim, like in the outskirts of Anaheim where they can still do Airbnb. I, I definitely want to, those are my next areas. So yeah, 10K for the gross is per property and hopefully get about 5K is sort of after all my fees and after, after everything is kind of like what I'm targeting. Love it, man. I mean, obviously you're you know, clearly, you know what you're doing, you're being very successful at it. So um, let's just, you know, a couple more things before we hop off here. So wh- why did you want to join, you know, the program and, you know, what was kind of the vision behind behind joining so that you could, you know, obviously supercharge your growth, but uh, let's talk about, you know, wh- why you wanted to join the program. Interesting, because like, person, uh, to be honest with you, right? So I've actually seen a lot of your other stuff be- even before the Airbnb stuff, right? So a lot of the, uh, the credit card stuff, right? A lot of the, uh, a lot of your, your short videos on, 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 on Instagram and stuff like that. So I see a lot of different things even before the Airbnb stuff. And when I saw you, yeah, I was like, oh, okay, oh, he's also doing Airbnb stuff. So I really kind of want to understand what, um, what, and I, you know, to, to give you credit, I think you do a really good job, right? You do a great job in providing information and it's very informative. And I can totally see that you're doing it not for the money or for the fame, but just doing it because you want to help others, right? And, and for me, it's very similar to that because, you know, I, I had a pretty successful like marketing career, right? I was managing marketing teams and I really didn't get into construction or even get into Airbnb for the money. You know, I always tell my wife, you know, I'm kind of doing Airbnb because I used to like Legos a lot. You know, I used to play Sims a lot and I love marketing. So I love the data aspect of it. And I'm kind of combining everything into one, right? So I'm doing, basically I'm playing real life Monopoly, Legos and Sims all together. And that's what I'm really doing, right? And I really wanted to kind of um, join this class to join join this membership to kind of understand sort of what other people are doing in their in their respective sort of uh, uh, management I guess the investing careers and kind of figure out any 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 way we can share knowledge but in fact like just really trying to help others right so you know if anybody has any questions feel free to add me on school or feel free, feel free to message me I'm I'm, all, I'm I'm an open book so I can totally help others as well right and that's one of the, kind of the main reasons and I think secondly is it's just Really to learn from you and from learn from from others, right? Because there's so much information out there. A couple of other things I've done so far is that you know there's uh, there's there's always like real estate groups. There's always like you know uh, short term rental groups. Uh, even as simple as joining like Facebook or even meetups. So I try my best to join those. And if you see the local ones, definitely join those as well, right? And you can kind of see other people with same same passion and same sort of uh, interests as you, right? But this group is also very interesting because now, I don't know if you noticed, but the first sort of few weeks when I joined, I was so busy setting up this house, I wasn't really like involved. Like I literally just had my membership there and I just sat there and I was like, oh man, I gotta finish this house. I really have to finish this house. So now that I have some more time, I'm like, okay, now I'm gonna really try to figure out how I can help the community and also try to try to be in more discussions, right? To help each other as well. Love it, man. Yeah, we'll definitely talk off offline to see how you, you, know, how you can get more involved because you, know, you have a lot of valuable insights just from this one conversation alone. Um, but yeah, man, to wrap this up, so, you know, what, what would you have to say to someone that's, you know, kind of considering, you know, starting an Airbnb business, um, and what, what's some words of, words of advice that you would give that, give to that person? I think, I think we mentioned a lot, right? So I think really just try to get in front of other people that are already in the business, such like, such as the Facebook groups and meetup groups and even this group, right? And where you can just get a lot of, just start being, start getting some dialogue with them, right? Because everybody has different experiences and there's no you know, unlike a math equation, right, where there's a right answer or a wrong answer, there's a lot of different perspectives and ways to do this and then to be successful in this business. You know, we mentioned some people do red arbitrage, and I'm not doing that, and I feel like I'm doing, I'm doing pretty well. And somebody could be doing really well doing arbitrage, right? So there's many different ways to attack this problem or attack this industry. You really want to just pick the brains of people that are already doing it and, and share knowledge and just try to figure out what, what, what you can offer each other and then definitely be able to learn from each other. 100%, 100% man. Well, appreciate the time, Gary. Um, you know, we, we both have children around the same age, two, two and a half. Um, it's a super fun age, you know, going, taking them to Disneyland. We just took our son recently, and I'm sure, you know, you, you guys are probably going to plan a trip out there soon, too. But, um, yeah, super insightful. Thanks for the time, and we'll talk to you soon, man. See you guys later.